It was a cold December, and the city was engulfed in darkness by the end of the afternoon. The cooker in the new flat was not hooked up yet, so Jean sent her daughter Helen, who was fifteen, to a local takeaway for a bag of fish and chips. While the rest of the family waited for Helen, Jean drew a hot bath. When you have young children, sometimes the only place you can find a moment of privacy is behind a locked bathroom door. Jean was small and pale, with delicate features and dark hair that she wore pulled back from her face. She slipped into the water and stayed there. She had just got out of the bath, her skin flushed, and somebody knocked on the front door. It was about seven. The children assumed it must be Helen with their dinner. But when they opened the door, a gang of people burst inside. It happened so abruptly that none of the McConville children could say precisely how many there were. It was roughly eight people, but it could have been ten or twelve. There were men and women. Some had balaclavas pulled across their faces. Others wore nylon stockings over their heads, which twisted their features into ghoulish masks. At least one of them was carrying a gun. As Jean emerged, pulling on her clothes, surrounded by her frightened children, one of the men said, gruffly, put your coat on. She trembled violently as the intruders tried to pull her out of the flat. What's happening? she asked, her panic rising. That was when the children went berserk. Michael, who was eleven, tried to grab his mother. Billy and Jim threw their arms around her and wailed. The gang tried to calm the children, saying that they would bring Jean back. They just needed to talk to her. She would be gone for only a few hours. Archie, who at sixteen was the oldest child at home, asked if he could accompany his mother wherever she was going, and the members of the gang agreed. Jean McConville put on her tweed overcoat and headscarf as the younger children were herded into one of the bedrooms. While they were ushering the children away, the intruders spoke to them, offering blunt assurances and addressing them by name. A couple of the men were not wearing masks, and Michael McConville realised, to his horror, that the people taking his mother away were not strangers. They were his neighbours. Davis Flats was a nightmare from an Escher drawing, a concrete warren of stairways, passages and overcrowded flats. The lifts were perpetually out of order and Jean McConville was borne by the rough little scrum out of her flat, through a corridor and down a set of stairs. Normally there were people about at night, even in the winter time, kids kicking a ball through the hallway or labourers coming home from work. But Archie noticed that the complex seemed eerily vacant almost as if the area had been cleared. There was nobody to flag down, no neighbour who could sound the alarm. He kept close to his mother, shuffling along, and she clung to him, not wanting to let go. But at the bottom of the stairs, a larger group was waiting, as many as twenty people, casually dressed and masked with balaclavas. Several of them had guns. A blue Volkswagen van sat idling at the curb, and now, suddenly, one of the men wheeled on Archie, the dull glint of a pistol arcing through the darkness, and pressed the tip of the barrel into his cheek. Archie froze. He could feel the cold metal pressing into his skin. He was desperate to protect his mother, but what could he do? He was a boy, outnumbered and unarmed. Reluctantly, he turned and ascended the stairs. On the second level, one of the walls was perforated by a series of vertical slats which the McConville children called pigeonholes. Peering through these openings, Archie watched as his mother was bundled into the van and the van drove out of Devis and disappeared. It would later strike him that the gang never had any intention of allowing him to chaperone his mother. They were simply using him to get Jean out of the flat he stood there in the awful, wintry silence, trying to comprehend what had just happened and what he should do now. Then he started back towards the flat. The last words that his mother had said to him were, Watch the children until I come back. <laughs>